Welcome to this talk on implementing sustainable construction. I will talk about challenges, pitfalls, potentials, and how the GLOBE consensus can leverage. My name is Wolfram Schmidt, and I work at the German Federal Institute for Materials Research and Testing in Berlin. And this is all about sustainability, and sustainability, as we all know, in the meantime, has really become on the public and political agenda, not at last with the formulation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And with a little bit of delay, also the entire framework of the built environment, the construction business has started to consider sustainability as one of the major um, challenges of the future. As we all know, the built environment is responsible for about 40% of the global energy demand and the global carbon emissions. And indeed, there are two sustainable development goals which are directly linked on um, sustainable cities and on infrastructure. But there are also more sustainable development goals which are directly linked somehow to everything that is related to the built environment um, like for example responsible consumption clean water and sanitation and then there are some more um, a little bit more indirectly linked um, sustainable development goals which are also kind of connected to uh, sustainable built environment sustainable construction and uh, construction materials consumption. So at the end of the day, we see that the built environment is heavily affecting the achievement of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. But the problem in the built environment is that we are struggling. We, um, we are struggling with the definitions, with measurement of sustainability, how to incorporate this into our financial markets, how to develop policies, how to model and also which are the objectives and targets that we need to achieve. So the reality is, unfortunately, that we are rather busy with um, understanding the present and the past or finding kind of a bureaucracy for dealing with it rather than implementing what we already know. And that causes a lot of chaos and uncertainty to the users, even though there are numerous reports and advice documents that can be helpful, that are often very inspirational, but often they are just focused on certain policies or on specific technologies, on a limited number of materials, they address stakeholders, sometimes they are just used as a marketing tool. And sometimes they are also a help to assess sustainability, to bring it into numbers. But the problem is that these assessment tools are so complicated and if I'm, facing a challenge, I want to build something, and I want to do it as sustainable as possible. It's not a help for me if someone gives me a 700 pages book and says, read it and find your own solution. And in this context, it's probably more straightforward to simplify things rather than to make it more and more complicated, bureaucratic and mathematical. The 10 golden rules for sustainable urban development developed by the Falconers Consortium, which is a um, female driven um, researchers and decision makers network is probably a very good approach uh, because it simplifies sustainability in this specific case on urban development uh, to those parameters which are valid all over the world, regardless of the boundary conditions. There's a simple version and also a commented version, um, which is quite interesting to read because there are some simple truths which are valid all over the world. We know that we have to use low emission technologies, low energy demand technologies. We want to avoid resource depletion. We want to create something with longevity. We also know that the most sustainable cities and structures are not those which are super sophisticated, which are high or have huge cantilevers, but rather reasonable low-key architecture where materials are used according to their strength, where local materials are used and where the structures are made for human beings and they create an added value to the society and to the economy. This is where we have to go. But the problem is that in every part of the world and uh, depending on the situation, um, the decision-making takes place, uh, different priorities will be given to these items. For example, it makes a difference whether I'm coming from regions where I'm way above the per capita carbon emission threshold to limit the temperature increase until 2050 to two degrees Celsius. And here we're talking about the two degrees um, target and not the 1.5 degrees target, which is more uh, on the agenda today. So most of the countries and the regions in the world, they have to give up on privileges. They have to reduce their consumption. While there's a limited number of regions which 
uh, is significantly below. So here we already have to discuss who should be the preacher and who should become a role model for, for the rest of the world. And particularly Sub-Saharan Africa stands out here because the per capita carbon emissions are extremely low. If we take a look at this region, however, we also see that there are so many huge differences. Just as an example, four cities, Lagos, um, Accra, Dar es Salaam, and Blantyre, all on the same continent, and they will all become mega cities in the near future. Um, so you could assume that probably similar concepts could be applied for these cities, but they cannot. For example, if you compare Blantyre and Dar es Salaam, they are so different. Blantyre is a small town today, but it's going to be a more than 40 million inhabitants town. So there's a huge growth of this um, city, which can which has a lot of degrees of freedom, while Dar es Salaam is already a metropolis today. So this limits the degrees of freedom, how to create this urban sprawl. Then you could compare Dar es Salaam and Lagos, which have similar dimensions in the future, 70 million, 80 million inhabitants. But we have to consider that Dar es Salaam in East Africa has a completely different culture than uh, Lagos in West Africa, and also the global networks, the communication with global partners, supply chains, and so on, are completely different. So um, also here, different concepts have to be developed, different priorities have to be given. And even in the same region like Lagos and Accra, we can see that Lagos is growing vertically, while Accra is growing very horizontally, which is certainly an effect of the landscape, of the geographical boundary conditions. But then again, we also see that uh, earlier or later, the cities always grow vertically because we assume that the real estate market and the optimization of, um, of financial gains due to um, urban structures um, is always given priority. But if we take a look at it from a sustainability point of view, we have to put that into question because huge structures are typically always materials wasting. So we also have to think about changing our priorities in general. And that brings us to another point. Certainly also my priorities will be different whether I'm coming from a situation of abundance or whether I'm coming from a situation where everything is lacking. Certainly my priorities are also different when I'm coming from a region where there's war, where there's unrest, or whether I'm coming from a region which is quite harmonious and where there's peace in my environment. It makes a difference whether I'm old or whether I'm a child. And certainly it makes a difference whether I'm male or female. I have different priorities also in the perceived safety in a structure, in infrastructure, in a city, um, but also certainly in the way um, how I interact with the built environment. Um, for example, in um, the way how I participate um, in decision-making in the built environment. So this already shows us um, how strongly sustainability is also linked to socioeconomic aspects. So when we talk about sustainability, um, particularly about design, materials, technology, structures, utilization, end of life, everything related to the built environment, we do not only have to focus on climate and environmental aspects, but we also have to see at equal level that there are socioeconomic criteria. And what makes it even more complicated is that um, this is somehow linked by the fact that whenever um, something is built, the landscape is permanently changed, which has an effect on the mobility of people, on the communication and how networks work. Um, at the same time, we also have things that change over the course of time, the service life. We have different user generations, which have different demands. We have to make sure that there is a durability, which is also deteriorating, that we create something which is circular all over the entire lifetime of a building. And this makes it super complicated and very difficult for an individual to find the best solution. And that's the problem. We are all dealing with human beings. Decision making depends upon individuals. And here our problem is that we are all uh, having our own knowledge bubble. Uh, we are all based on the information we're having that we're receiving on the knowledge that we've obtained over the course of our lifetime. And if we just look at the, the simple process of a uh, of building a structure, we have investors. They typically want to have a return on investment. They do not think so much about sustainability typically, and they want to create maximum visibility for marketing purposes. Uh, an architect typically wants to create something which is unique, something which stands out, but something which is unique and stands out typically is always quite materials wasting. The society doesn't really appreciate 
low-key architecture, which is probably more sustainable, but not as outstanding as the high structures or the um, huge cantilever structures. Then as a structural engineer, I'm getting paid according to the project volume. So I do not have an intrinsic drive to reduce the materials due to structural design. The opposite is the case. Then if I'm providing materials, if I'm a material supplier, typically and traditionally, we always considered overperformance as a quality factor, as something which gives additional safety. We also have to change that mindset somehow. And certainly if I'm a contractor, I just want to keep the times, no matter the price uh, in, in money or in um, environmental impact. So the only way to get this all together is to find standards, regulations, a common mindset, policies and laws, which are certainly driven by the society, by the industry, and by uh, policy makers and political decision makers. And this is where the GLOBE consensus comes into the game, because the GLOBE consensus wants to provide this policy advice and also provide public information. The GLOBE consensus is a statement um, that calls for unprecedented, more holistic approaches where the environment, materials, structures, and society are considered as a unit and everything has to become more circular in um, the way how it's operated. Um, certainly, this is something many people have stated, but the unique item of the GLOBE consensus is that um, the GLOBE consensus was agreed, was agreed upon between major international institutions that deal with all the relevant aspects for the built environment, bridges and structures, structural design, building construction research, structural concrete materials, and also shell and spatial structures. Um, you can see all these associations on the right hand side. So um, probably the GLOBE consensus has the biggest and highest level expert network in the background. And therefore the consensus itself was also formulated by a huge number of international experts. You can see uh, the names here on this slide. It's a five pages document only, but it's very precise and uh, giving advice and requirements. Um, you can find it, you can download it on the website globe.rylam.net. In the meantime, it has been translated into various languages and we continue to translate it um, in the near future. It can be supported. Um, you can support Globe as an individual or also as an organization. Um, you can also leave a comment. This gives more emphasis on the importance of this initiative. And just to understand that GLOBE is not only a statement that was made once, but GLOBE also wants to bring something into the future. Here's the way how it operates. So the different associations that I mentioned before, they have a liaison committee where they adjust their strategies. In the past, they have already formed the Joint Committee on Structural Safety. That was already 1971. Uh, it's still operating and now they have identified that sustainability is a major uh, connecting parameter between these associations and therefore the joint committee on the globe consensus has been formed to really become an entity that can become active and create actions and these actions will be developed by working parties which are recruited from the different associations to create publications to create events and also social media content with the overall objective to become uh, a group of experts to give policy advice and also inform the public. This will all happen in the near future. Something has already happened. Uh, the, co the committee was just formed recently and we have uh, started with a webinar on bottlenecks and potentials where high level uh, influential um, decision makers have talked about their views on the built environment. Um, there was a big discussion and the results of the discussion of this webinar will now set the scene for a workshop which will take place in Lausanne in April this year. And in this workshop, we want to create content and a concept for a tangible policy advice document, which will be reviewed and revised by the GLOBE members and also experts. And this shall still happen before the COP27 in order to create impact. So you see, this is a very dynamic development and uh, everybody is invited to participate. So please visit the webpage, sign in as an individual or as a, an institution, feel free to leave a statement. This will all be considered and um, um, ensure that you can probably also participate actively in the uh, working parties for future document creation. 
If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to contact the chairman of the committee, Michael Habufaba, or also Karen Scrivener or myself. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention.